So we're finishing up the uh, the Mishnah of Shekalem, and we're into a into a lost and found. We're into a long list of lost and found. And we're going to deal today with three Mishnayot, <clears throat> which are going to gradually progress from the center of the temple out to the whole of the land of Israel. So we're spreading out geographically from stuff which is lost or found in the temple to stuff which is lost or found further away. And we'll see we'll see the pattern develop as we go through. We're going to begin right in the temple courtyard, Basar Shinim Saba Azara, meat which is found right in the courtyard. So someone's found a piece of meat. Well, what are we going to do with it? Well, that's the question of the Mishnah. If a rim or lot, if there are whole limbs, we assume they're burnt offerings. If we find pieces, we assume that they're sin offerings, because sin offerings were actually cut up into small pieces and eaten by the Kohanim. If we found them outside the temple precincts, but still in Jerusalem, we assume that they're peace offerings. Most peace, most offerings actually were peace. A peace offering is a very simple thing. Anybody can bring a peace offering. It's burnt in entirety on, uh, yeah, everybody brings a peace offering. Most of these offerings are peace offerings, actually. So that's the hierarchy. The problem is with these offerings that we can't do anything with them. We can't do them because they, they've been lost and they've been found. So effectively, the attention of the Kohanim has been diverted from them. So they're no longer eligible to be put on the altar or to be burnt on the altar. On the other hand, we can't do anything else with them. So what are we going to do? And, and we've seen this, by the way, with, with trauma. We can't destroy trauma. But we, it, let's say trauma becomes unfit for eating by a priest. Say trauma becomes tame. We can't destroy it. But on the other hand, we can't give it to the Kohen. So we have to kind of leave it until it goes off. And this is what we're going to do here. Both of these cases, we're going to leave it until its appearance passes. Or its appearance changes. Essentially, we're going to leave it to go off. And then the sale of eight and then we can burn it. And by this time, one or two days have passed. It'll be after the time that the sacrifice becomes unfit for consumption by the Kohanim. So at that point, there's nothing to do with it except to burn it. So we, we put it out for place of burn. What about if it's found outside Jerusalem? So it's found somewhere in the borders. The, the, the Mishnah just says in the borders, but this, I put the borders of Israel on the sword sheet, because we're assuming here we're in the borders of the land of Israel. But it's not in Jerusalem. And at this point, actually, we're going to assume that these are not sacrifices. So, Nimzabi Bulev, Evarim Nevelot, if they're limbs, we kind of assume they're carrying. We assume they're carrying. And, you know, we don't know, right? We don't, we don't know. Maybe we're being a little bit strict here. We assume they're carrying hatichot mutarot. If it's sliced up into pieces, we sort of assume it's human food. And at this point, by the way, we can eat it. The Mishnah says mutarot. And it's very interesting. The Mishnah does not seem to be concerned here about kashrut. The, the, whole, the whole line that we're taking in the Mishnah of Shekalim is that we're extremely concerned about tuma and tahira. And we're extremely concerned about sacrifices which have got kind of gone wrong, gone to the wrong places. Kashrut seems less of an issue at this point. So pieces are permitted. And this, by the way, is a in a time where Jews are living in the land of Israel. And I, I think the assumption is that if it's found in a town that belongs to Gentiles, then it would not be permitted. But we're assuming it's found in a place that belongs to Jews. It seems to be. For human consumption, so we can eat it and go further than that. We'll be shut our raga, we'll be shut our rega at the time of the festival. Shabbasam will be at the time of the festival. There's lots and lots of eating about, lots and lots of eat about meat, lots and lots of meat about being eaten at a time of a festival. 
Shehabasan Murube of Evarun Mutawin. At that point, even whole limbs are permitted. We fried a whole limb, we can eat it, we assume that it's you know it's been slaughtered in a kosher manner, it's a kosher piece of meat. We assume we can eat it. The what, if we, what I'm looking at what yeah. if we what if we find what what if we find a whole animal? So, so what if rather than finding a limb, we find a whole animal? So we find some behema, some cattle, wandering around somewhere between Jerusalem and Migdal Eder. We're not quite sure where Migdal Eder is. It's actually mentioned in Micha, by the way. I brought you the Pasuk on the sword sheet. Beata Migdal Eder. Ofel Batsion. Adecha Teate. It's mentioned in it's, it's it's mentioned in Micha. We don't, but that Micha doesn't tell us where it is, but it seems to be pretty close to Jerusalem. Because we're going to assume that this live animal is actually dedicated as a sacrifice. So we're assuming that if it's found kind of wandering around in Jerusalem or in the outskirts of Jerusalem, it seems to be a burnt offering or some kind of offering. A beast which is found in Jerusalem or out as far as Migdal Eder. And the same distance in any direction. So we're not talking specifically about Migdal Eder. Any, anything of that kind of distance. If it's a male, we assume it's a burnt offering. If it's a female, we assume it's a peace offering. Rabbi Yudah adds, by the way, that if we find an animal that's fit for a Pesach, so in other words, a male, and it's a year old, right? And it's a goat or a sheep, so we could actually bring it as a Pesach offering. If we find something that is fit for a Pesach offering, we can use it as a Pesach offering if we find it a month before Pesach. And at that point, I guess we're assuming that it's dedicated as a Pesach offering. So we don't have to offer it up as a peace offering or a, a burnt offering. Now, what happened in practice? Well, remember that if we find this animal and we offer it up as a burnt offering, we're going to have to offer the libations with it. We're going to have to offer the wine and oil and the, and the corn. Yeah, just as we learned when we looked at the Pasha of um, uh, Pinchas a few days ago. And we learned that when you bring these to the temple, you have to pay for the offerings. You get a receipt. You take it to the libations dispensary. You take your receipt to the dispensary and you get your libations. Well, what if, and that is fine, by the way, if you bring your own animal, but what if you just found an animal wandering around outside? Do you have to pay for the libations? Maybe you're not going to hand the animal in. Barishona, hayu mam shiknin, mumash, sorry, mumash kanin. Barishona, hayu mumash kanin. At first, they used to take a pledge. They used to take a mortgage. Et Motseha, they used to take a mortgage from anyone who actually found an animal. Until that person actually brought the libations to go with the bird offering or with a peace offering. So if you brought an animal, you actually had to pay for its offerings. Of course, what happens? Well, people stop finding them. People would revert to just leaving the animal where it was and running away. And it's very interesting, by the way. The Mishnah is not suggesting that they would take the animal home and eat it. So clearly there's some kind of respect for the sanctity of the altar, in the sense that people are, people are not finding these animals and taking them home and just slaughtering them and eating them. They want to take them to the temple, but they don't want to pay a financial penalty for taking them to the temple. So the rabbis make a takana, and this is, you know, now we use the word tikkun olam to refer to um, setting the world right. But 
in the time of the Mishnah, the word tikkun olam generally means a, a, a change which the Bet Din makes in order to correct a mistake in halakha. And this is where what we have here. So originally, people would just leave the animal and run away. Hitkinu Beit Din. The Beit Din made a takana, the Beit Din decreed. Sheyu nesacheha ba'in Michel Tzibor. That the libation offerings should come from public funds. So in other words, the public should pay the libation offerings of a found animal. And of course, this then resets the incentives in the correct manner. We've got our tikkun olam, and people then begin to bring the animals into the temple as they should do if they're found wandering around lost somewhere between Jerusalem or in the outskirts.